That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now. From the beginning. Welcome to BX, Beyond Stereotypes, a podcast about lawyers using their authentic voices to change the world. The idea of focus on one point is in, it could be a music or a mantra or something else, and your mind will go quiet, actually, and you will start to feel a deep sense of peace. So that's what I tap into, like, and even when I'm teaching, because I still get nervous if I have a lecture of 120 students, and I don't know them. I mean, it's always nerve wracking. I mean, that's kind of the place I'll go. I'll have one point of focus to kind of just focus on why I'm here, not on the personalities, not on what I think they're going to think of me, not on judgment. And so it's really been a great tool for me when I, there are these outside threats, and they could be, what are people going to think of me, or are they going to take me seriously, to just kind of bring it back to the focus of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and what's important to me. And it really does quiet the other chatter down. Um, and ultimately, you feel more liberated. Welcome to Beyond Stereotypes. With me today is Sheila Foster. We're going to BS a little bit. Um, Sheila is fascinating. Um, and I, I do know Sheila personally. We attended Berkeley Law School together, but um, she's, uh, her trajectory has fully eclipsed mine, and I'm very proud of her. Um, Sheila is a professor of law at, uh, in public policy at Georgetown. She's an expert in the area of environmental justice. And I just want to say thank you, Sheila, for being here. Uh, with us, and um, I, I appreciate you joining us today. It's great to be here. It's great to reconnect. We're off just so many years, and I think it's safe to say that your career is in, incredibly impressive. So maybe someone can interview <laughs> you too one day on the same podcast. Yeah. I'd love to hear your story. Cool. cool. Well, uh, I paid her to say that, y'all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, the, the, the first thing, and, and I, I, I want um, to acknowledge that I do follow you on, on uh, social media, Instagram and, and Twitter and Facebook. And, and, you know, one of the reasons I wanted you to be on the show is because it's, I, I've just been so fascinated by all of the things that, you're, that you do professionally and, and, and personally. And so I, I, I think that... Um, our viewer, I'm sorry, our, our listeners will be uh, really uh, moved and, and also uh, inspired um, by, by you and the kind of things that you're working on. Um, so, so the first question I have for you should say that when I was researching you, I saw that you actually um, that you actually have taught all over the world, um, Italy and um, Cuba and, and places like that. And so my first question is, do you speak any of these languages? <laughs> and how, yeah, how, yeah, how do you get along? Yeah, I do. Um, the Italian experience is more recent. Um, I, uh, partly coming out of that research in Latin America, I started thinking about cities very differently and uh, have been putting together um, a framework to help cities to redevelop more equitably in, um, outside of a hyper-capitalist uh, framework. And the first place that I was invited to try this was in Bologna, Italy, with the city. I work with the city. And then I've also been invited to teach at various universities in Italy, including Scuola Superiore, Sant'Anna, and Pisa. I'm speechless right now because I had no idea that you um, spoke these other languages and the things that we learn about people, you know, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast because, you know, we want to talk about what makes, what makes you unique and, and, and more importantly, you know, what stereotypes you feel um, people make about you. So let me ask you this. Um, and our listeners can't see you, but I will tell people she looks 12. Um, God bless you. And, 
<laughs> and I will also, just to keep this a little light, uh, give you credit for, uh, our, you know, I was following you on, on Instagram and I noticed that you had started going gray and then you were kind of doing this thing where it was part gray and not part gray. And I was starting to do the same thing and you, and I text, I uh, messaged you and you said, Merle, it's, it's called a ground gray. It's a new, <laughs> it's a new phenomenon. And, and so you inspired me. See, I'm telling you, you can inspire people for all kinds of things. You inspired me to to go with it, and um, and I and so I've been doing this groundbreak too. Um, but but back to 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 stereotypes. You do look really really young, and here you are, this this expert. Not only are you a black woman, but you know you're this expert in this very heady how do you feel? And um, I'm sure you're meeting with people who are, you know, make, you know, forming stereotypes about you when, when you walk into a room, even if you have a brown bread. Um, and, you know, how, how does that, how, how has that worked for you and, and how do you deal with that? Or, or am I just off base? No, oh, I mean, I think that's exactly right. So first of all, um, I love disrupting expectations. So, um, and it's been that way my whole life, in part because I look so young, right? Um, and although I'm looking less young <laughs> than I used to, but, uh, <laughs> you know, coming out of law school, when you and I graduated from law school, like I looked like a baby. Like no one ever took me seriously as a lawyer. And a few years after that, when I started teaching, um, I certainly faced a lot of, I wouldn't say open resistance from students, but certainly more questioning of my authority. Um, it, it showed up in my teaching evaluations. Um, it's the intersectionality, really, of being, you know, a woman, a black woman, and a young black woman. Um, so, um, and so I think I've grown into myself a little bit more. I don't look my age, which is great. I used to hate not looking my age because I want people to take me seriously. Now I'm happy not to look my age because right. I want to look my age. <laughs> um, and so um, I still get looks from people, um, in, in particular when I travel internationally, but not just that, because I think it, even more so. Women, you don't find a lot of female law professors in, or professors in the places I've been, including West Africa, South Africa, Latin America, or uh, even Italy, shockingly. Um, and even less so in at least the Western world, um, women of color uh, or young women of color. But in this country, you know, I do get questioned more. Um, and it is true that I can overcome that. So I taught at Fordham University for many years. I had really established my authority there as a teacher. I was vice dean. No one questioned me after a number of years. When I moved to Georgetown okay. a few years ago and I taught my first uh, class, the first year, I was stunned that my teaching evaluations came in so poorly because I had been regarded at Fordham as a top teacher, always got you know top evaluations. It was really quite shocking to me, and I remember having a uh, conversation with our associate dean for academics and also the registrar, and they read them, and they were like, wow, these students were really unfair to you. Um, and the associate dean said to his credit, he said, you know, I've seen this before, you know, with women and, and women of color. Um, so, you know, I think to their credit, they were able to contextualize it, but I'll never forget that there was one comment in those evaluations. And this was just three years ago, right? I've had 25 okay. uh, years of uh, teaching experience, right? I recognize it as an expert, but still I get this, right? When I change schools and that kind of, that capital that I built up, that reputational capital, it's, it's kind of like starting over. So I was shocked, but one comment in those evaluations, I'll never forget reading it, and it said that something to the effect that I feel like Professor Foster was constantly questioned because of her race and gender, that she was not treated fairly. Before. I mean, this student just put it out there. Now, the evaluations are, wow. uh, so I don't know who, but but that was like a clarifying moment for me because I'm reading these evaluations, I'm like, what? You know, and, uh, and then all the students, the student says, bam, you know, this is what was happening behind the scenes. Now, I didn't pick up any of this in class, right? I mean, this class, 104 students, uh, 107 students, um, you know, there was no open hostility. You know, I, in law school, as you know, there's a seating chart. You call in students, they answer. People were respectful. People came to my office hours, had no idea that this undercurrent. And it wasn't a lot of students. I mean, I would say in a class of 107, 
maybe this was 20 or 25 students, but those are the students in evaluation that are the loudest. So the people that either love you a lot or really didn't like you for whatever reason um, have an outsized role in that kind of feedback. So, so those stereotypes, you know, remarkably, no matter if you look at my CV or you say, wow, you know, you've done a lot of great things, you have this reputation, you've published all over, still <laughs> I can walk into a situation where that's not front and center or people don't know that and still get questioned, still have my authority questioned, teaching in an area that I'm an expert in. Right, right. So, so are there, do, do you think about that going into meetings? So it's funny, Merle, because my attitude about this goes all the way back to law school, right? I remember when we were in law school and people would say, it's mostly our cohort of folks, African-American folks, et cetera, like, you know, just, you know, P equals JD, let's just get by, you know, and then we heard like, right. of color, don't pass the bar. And so, you know, I feel like, for me, I rejected all those messages back then because I thought, like, I'm not going to carry this heavy weight of these expectations either low expectations or from our peers because we've, I think, um, internalized those low expectations or what the data is telling me about how my group might uh, succeed. So I kind of shut those out, right? That has, I think, its upside in that it protects my peace of mind and it gives me the space to succeed at the level that I think I can to just go for it. The downside is, is what just happened to me, which is that I didn't think that was possible anymore, or I just, I don't carry that with me because I feel like it's so heavy. You know, I even, these days, I have a teenage son who's in high school, and he's beginning to face a lot of the race stereotypes being a black boy, and and just all the stuff of high school, and then you kind of put race in, and also his gender on top of it. And I'm constantly talking to him about this racial tax. And I said, you know, don't let people, you know, rent that space in your head for free, right? I mean, you're going to face enough stuff just being a black boy and then a black man in society. Um, try not to take in everything that's said to you or that you think you're reading in the environment. Uh, because at the end of the day, you're kind of paying that tax in a way that those folks aren't, right? Um, and so I've tried to live my life like that. Meditation has helped. It's just like, you know, how do you move through this world with all this. And I learned from my mother, who was actually my main role model, because my mother came up during segregation. Now, you know, she was told she couldn't be a doctor, so she went to nursing school. She was head of nursing in Detroit, had this great career, you know, uh, even took care of uh, Diana Ross. When, when we moved to Miami, she went back to school. She got a PhD. She became a dean and a vice provost. And living with wow. her, she would always say, <laughs> Like, you know, I mean, she faced racism. She brought it home. She talked about it. She faced sexism. But she was just like, hey, just get up and do it and, you know, get your education. No one can take that from you. Uh, be your best, you know, and just keep going on. Don't mind those folks. You know, when you have to fight back, fight back. I've had moments of having to fight back and to right. check people and to check people, you know, literally. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the the black the black mother experience is is something that we could probably do a whole nother uh, uh, podcast about. But the story that I like my my parents are both from Oklahoma, and the, the story and I was born in Oklahoma, and the story that I like to tell people is about how my mother grew up in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and had to deliver the laundry that that her mother did, her, and my and her mother was a nurse. Um, but, you know, she was also doing laundry and she would deliver this laundry and she had to walk from the black side of town to the white side of town. And, and when she did that, she would always pass by a ballet studio and she would stop and she would look in this window and little bl black girls weren't allowed to do ballet back then. Yeah. And her, she said to herself then as a child, if I ever have a daughter, my daughter will be a ballerina. And, you know, and she lived up to that. I mean, both my sister and I started ballet when we were really young and we did it most of our, our young life and we got really good. And, you know, those are the kind of experiences that, you know, and exposures that really make a difference. 
uh, in your life and, and, and allow you to deal with, you know, that racial tax. I love that term, that racial tax that you're talking about. What do you think makes you authentic and different? And how do you, um, how, how do you, how do you keep your authenticity in, in, you know, a fairly, uh, conservative field? Yeah, so I mean, it's funny because academia actually is not that conservative. It's true the practice of law is, but um, and, it's, and it's really interesting to find still a lot of bias and even uh, sometimes not so coded racism and sexism, I'd say, um, even among people in what is considered to be a pretty progressive environment, right? Um, uh, both in terms of uh, students and faculty, um, and these issues still come up. So, um, so uh, it's easy to be who I am in terms of thinking about the things I think about and, and talking and writing about uh, the concepts I do because I'm already in an environment where that's welcome. Uh, but to your point, how do you stay authentic um, even when, regardless of whether it's a progressive or conservative environment, I just think those are, you know, different sides of the same coin. Um, it just, the manifestations are a little differently, how bias manifests. But I just, you know, I just feel like I, first of all, need to keep speaking my truth about who I am, what I do, and not pretend to be something different. Um, right. Not to pretend to be anything that I'm not. And I've always thought that I had to, even when I've you know, interviewed for various law schools, I've taught now at four law schools, uh, or even at the law firm, it's just that, you know, I'm just going to say who I am, what I'm interested in. If it's a fit, they'll hire me. If it's not, that's fine too, uh, because I don't want to be someplace and to have to pretend to be someone I'm not. The other thing I think that helps me is to stay grounded. In, uh, in particular, I think in academia, it's very hard to keep one's head in the cloud. Um, and I've spent almost all of my teaching career, yeah, I write the articles and the books, but uh, I, I, I do a lot of work on the ground. Um, whether it's in places like Camden or Harlem, where I was uh, really um, ensconced in the environmental justice work, and even doing some litigation there, but, but always working with the communities and the people that I went to law school to help, actually. Um, so right. For, right. For, for me, my mother grew up poor in Miami, in Overtown, Miami built their own house you know like if you've ever seen the movie moonlight i always tell people like that was the neighborhood we moved to in miami um i mean we wow okay made, you know made our way up into the suburbs but my but my dad had a, a a bodega or a small grocery store in overtown and our church was in overtown so even when we lived in kendall when we got to the suburbs eventually really right as i was going into high school we would drive 45 minutes into Overtown, which was a historically black, low-income community because my dad worked there and to go to church. And my mother, she used to always tell us, like, you're no better than these folks. You know, you're no better. This is where I'm from. And so for me, staying connected to why I'm doing this work helps me to put aside all the other BS that's going on either at the university, the faculty, student evaluations, whatever. It's like, you know what? Really, I'm doing this for because my purpose on this earth is to help the disenfranchised and to use my talent. Thank you. And, and so for me, that's really all that, that and my family are really all that <laughs> that matters. And right. so once you're grounded to that, I mean, and so I mentioned meditation. I spent like a lot, like, probably 25 years really uh, seriously meditating because one thing that meditation teaches you is to focus and be quiet on one thing and let and be a witness to all the other stuff happening around you. So to get into that witness state for me is to be grounded and focused on what you're focused on. And you're like a witness to the other drama, right? But you don't have to buy into it. You don't have to get involved in it. And so that's, I keep coming back to that place of like, it's interesting that you mentioned med meditation because I just I started meditating um, 30 days ago. I just and and I've been using an app, um, uh, the Calm app, uh, to do it, and I'm I'm really it's really helping me 
a lot because, it, and at first I thought, what is this doing? I'm just sitting here. Yeah, um, right. and, and, then I, and then I realized at one point when I actually used it outside of meditating, where I, you know, said, you know what, that, that's a distraction. Just go back to, 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 uh, to your home base. And I, I was saying that to myself, and I thought, that's what I just learned in meditation. So I think, I think that this is something that our listeners, if they haven't tried, uh, should try. And um, now, when you started meditating, did you do that? Did you go someplace to do it, or how, how did you do that? I did. So when I was living in the Bay Area right after law school, I think I was practicing or even uh, teaching by that point. Um, I don't know, at some point, you know, maybe late 20s or something, I was starting to really question, like, you know, what I wanted to do. Why am I practicing in big law? That's not really, you know, just a lot of questions. So I was uh, what I would call a seeker. You know, I was looking for just some peace of mind, larger answers. And someone introduced me at an ashram in the Bay Area, the meditation. Okay. Um, and I've since moved away from that experience of being in a, a formal place where you sit in an ashram and just kind of incorporated it into my life. I mean, what I love about meditation is that you don't have to sit down, turn on the music and be formal about it. Meditation literally just means focus. Like if you could be doing the dishes and have that music in your background and focus and your mind will automatically go quiet after a while. At first, it's loud and there's a lot of chatter, and that's what makes it uncomfortable yes. because yes. And you're like, what am I doing? What is this doing? But eventually, the point is, is that after a long time of focus and just even if you have some music in the background, I could be on the subway meditating. Just the idea of focus on one point, is, and it could be a music or a mantra or something else, and your mind will go quiet, actually, and you will start to feel a deep sense of peace. So that's what I tap into. Like, and even when I'm teaching, because I still get nervous if I have a lecture of 120 students and I don't know them, I mean, it's always nerve wracking. I mean, that's kind of the place I'll go. I'll have one point of focus to kind of just focus on why I'm here, not on the personalities, not on what I think they're gonna think of me, not on judgments. And so it's really been a great tool for me when I, there are these outside threats and they could be, what are people going to think of me? Or are they going to take me seriously? To just kind of bring it back to the focus of why I'm doing what I'm doing um, and what's important to me. And it really does quiet the other chatter down. Um, and ultimately, you feel more liberated. So that's my, that's, that's, awesome. that's been my kind of secret tool <laughs> over my career. And it's helped me through a lot of stuff because you know, I do travel in a lot of different circles. I've traveled a lot, both physically uh, and otherwise, um, in terms of my experiences. And new experiences are very scary, particularly if you have in the back so, of your mind, what are people going to think of me? Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that brings me to a question I think um, could be interesting. Um, I grew up in Compton, and, and I feel like, you know, I've had to be able to um, – travel, you know, or, or exist in very different environments, you know, and, and it's, it's allowed me to, to be able to um, communicate um, in very different ways, depending on the situation that I'm in. I mean, you, you, you touched on that having grown up in Miami and, and now you're in New York and, and then you're, you know, all over the country, you know, how, you know, how do you feel like, you know, uh, how, how many, how is that for you in terms of having to turn, turn on one, uh, one Sheila, and turn off another Sheila? I mean, I, I think that especially people who go to law school would, would benefit from understanding um, how, you know, you've had to exist in so many different environments. Yeah, that's a great question. Um... You know, because I am a free spirit and I like to literally uh, be out in the world, um, but still have a grounding. Um, and that does involve constantly facing some uncertainty about shifting environments. And I, I, I mean, for me, it's kind of helped by having lived so many places. And like I say, partly Detroit, I have a lot of family there. I went back to Michigan, partly Miami, then California, then I moved to Philly, then New York. Now I'm uh, teaching in Washington. Um, and I've traveled all over. And so for me, I guess I'll come back to the, I think it's so important to 
stay connected to who you are. I mean, I don't feel like I change or switch any part of myself off when I go into different environments. I mean, of course, you have to follow social customs when you're traveling someplace or in a situation where you know those customs are differently are different out of respect. But I'm not changing who I am. Um, and I will also say that I'm a, that I'm a kind of extroverted introvert. So my inclination is to observe first and to get a sense of my environment before I fully step into it um, in terms of speaking up or doing other things that has its upsides and, and also costs sometimes. But, um, but I guess I'll go back to the point that I made about meditation. I mean, once I became really comfortable and rooted in who I am and kind of convinced myself that the only people that matter in terms of judgment are either my family or the people paying my salary, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> ultimately, my boss. Uh, but, um, and everyone else is, and of course, my loved ones and friends and, you know, people you care about, but everything else I just kind of feel like is, I'm just not going to take that on. Um, and so that does give me the freedom, the liberation to just say, this is who I am. And now the benefit of having had a long career, as you know, is that often when you come into a room, I don't come on a blank slate. Like, you know, typically, especially with the internet, people can read about me. They know who they're going to meet, right? And so, uh, right. so, so now I'm a lot more confident that, hey, I've got this whole career in all of these publications, and now I'm at Georgetown, like, I've got all this status behind me, right? So in that sense, I don't worry as much as I would have done as a young lawyer coming out of law school. I think I had a lot more anxiety. Um, do, do you have any specific examples of a time or one specific example of a time where you just decided, I, I, I have to just be me in this situation? and um, how it was received and, and, and what the outcome was? So I tell you, the time where I think I stepped out most forcefully in that sense is when I left the law firm. Um, uh, because that ended up being a big deal because I was on the front of the San Francisco Chronicle <laughs> for... Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, because the law firm where I was at was going through a whole diversity thing or and I forgot what the story was, but it was related to their lack of diversity or their uh, inability to keep black lawyers or something. And, uh, and so they were interviewing some folks, but I was in that situation. And I remember at the law firm, a very quote unquote progressive law firm, it was considered to be. And even then there, and, and there were black lawyers, but I remember the partner I worked for, uh, who was at the time a youngish woman, um, who was very powerful in the firm, was a partner. And every time she would see myself and another black lawyer and let's say the black receptionist standing around talking, she'd always pass and go, what is this, a conspiracy? Um, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was things like that at this law firm that was quote unquote progressive, had a lot of black lawyers and a lot of black partners for that time in particular. Um, that just, drove home to me, notwithstanding the prestige of being there. And even my mother was so upset when I left because she was like, wait a minute, you've made it. Like from her era, it's like, why would you leave this prestigious law firm? But I right. really felt so out of place, um, even though the partner would say, oh, if you stay, you'll become partner, like the black attorneys or the black partners would really encourage me. I was kind of a rising young star there. And I just said, I'm out. That's it. And that was a hard thing to do because of all the expectations, the good expectations. People had all these hopes for me, even my own mother. She was so disappointed, <laughs> even though I wanted right. to do what she was doing, which is being academia. But she saw this as the kind of creme de la creme of, of a law career. So that was, one, you know, one instance where I just broke with it um, and just said, I got to go find out. I'm supposed to be doing with this career. I'm young enough to know that if I make a mistake and I fall down, I can, you know, get back up and do something else. Um, and, you know, the only other example I would give, and it's probably not really relevant to a lot of practicing lawyers, but it could be in terms of what you practice, it, much like what I write. When I started writing about environmental justice, I'll never forget some colleagues that one of the schools I was at early in my career was basically tell me it wasn't law that I was writing. And this person was an environmental lawyer and an environmental law professor. And he said, 
this is just not environmental law. Like you're writing about race and the intersection of this, you know, civil rights and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you're going to have a hard time doing tenure. And, you know, I just kept doing it. I was just like, okay, if I don't get tenure, I'm not going to get tenure. I'm just going to keep doing my thing. I had mentors in the, you know, not at that school, but at other schools. Um, and I, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, this is why I'm here. If I can't do this, it's like the law firm. I don't want to just have a job and collect a paycheck, right? I need to connect to like, what I think I'm here to do. And so I just kept at it, right? Um, notwithstanding this clear signal from my senior colleague in my field <laughs> that I would not get tenure if I kept writing about this. So, but you know, the time came, not only did I get tenure, I got a, a promotion to full professor at the same time. I'd written so much. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's, that, and that's very much like, what I decided to do when I, you know, I, I became a recruiter, um, much to my father's chagrin, but um, he was very proud of me before he passed away. But when I decided, you know, that my passion was diversity recruiting, mm -hmm. um, and that, that, that was just what I needed to do because, you know, somebody needed to do it. And it was well before it became a thing, which it, which it, which it is now. You know, I was told by a lot of recruiters and, and people in the industry that I was wasting my time. Hmm. Um, and like you, I just stuck with it because, you know, it mattered to me and it needed to matter to somebody. And it turned out I was ahead of the curve. Right. So, you know, I don't know. Did they teach us that in Berkeley? I don't know. Or did no, they I don't think they taught us that <laughs> I don't think <laughs> no, no, no. We can't give Berkeley credit. We can give we can give uh, Berkeley credit for a lot of things, but not for that. Um, not bad, huh? Okay. No, no. Well, we, we tried. We um, tried. Exactly. So, okay, this this has been amazing, Sheila. I do have one last question, and this is a question that I've asked everybody. Um, and I think you've kind of answered it all the way through, but I still I feel like I I really need to ask you this and. And that is, what role does diversity, inclusion, and equity play in how you walk through life both personally um, and professionally? And, you know, you've talked a lot about professionally, so I don't know, you might want to answer this personally, but um, I've asked this question of everybody, so I um, wanted to throw it at you as well. So I'll give you a kind of new answer and go personally. So I'm also, you know, married to a woman, and um, which we've been married or been together 15 years with a son. Another part of my difference in diversity that, again, people don't expect, <laughs> and I'm constantly coming out. Um, but I would say at some point, and again, my mother was not happy about this. She came around, of course, before, well before her death. I mean, we're very close. But oh, black, I could imagine a black mama. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. And she was like, it wasn't even about religion. It was just like, people are going to treat you badly, like you're already black and a woman. Okay. Then you're going to add this, right? Um, but, you know, it was another instance, like, I just got to be me. <laughs> and so, and she came to respect that and, and love it. And she was a great, you know, grandmother and all that before she died. Um, but what I want to say is that, you know, at some point, I really believe in this concept of intersectionality that, you know, Ken Crenshaw has written about. Um, but at some point, it's not just about being black or something about being a woman or gay, it's like, at some point I felt like I'm so outside of the white male norm that it just kind of at some point liberates me to be who I am right. because, you know, you could go either way and I've seen a lot of people suffer, right, uh, under the weight of their diversity or their differences uh, because they take on all of these messages that were fed and they may also have other structural impediments. The one thing I'm not is poor. So if I, on top of all this, right know, did not have the career I had, I might be singing a different tune. So I'm humble enough to suggest that. But um, I've been, you know, able to turn, I like to be playful with it, I guess, and to turn my diversity mm -hmm. into things that I, that, you know, I mean, obviously people can see that I'm a woman or black. They often don't know how old I am. Or, and they don't know that I'm married to one. <laughs> so, you know, I like to kind of play with that and kind of surprise people because there's so much learning that people still have to do around all of these identities. Um, so for me, mm -hmm. I use it, I'm a, a natural teacher. I use it as, I feel like an opportunity to teach. If, if I don't take it on as a burden, 
and say like, oh, I'm so oppressed, all these, you know, because I don't feel that way, um, although I understand their bias and the structural impediment to embodying these um, identities. But if I use it as an opportunity to, you know, disrupt people's biases because they don't expect me to be something, I don't look like a law professor either in those cases, right? So, um, and so if people aren't expecting my difference, and then it's like, oh, okay, either I'm telling them I'm married to a woman, or they're like, oh, you're a law professor. Oh, you've been doing this for how many years? Then for me, it's great to see like maybe a light bulb has turned on, right? Maybe they've had to right. disrupt or rethink their assumption. Um, and so for me, it feels like another thing that I'm here to do in life, right? Not that I think you should be teaching white people. I'm not coming. I don't want anybody to, to interpret this like it's our burden. But I just say for me personally, it's a way of lightening, I think, what would other, what is often heavy baggage when we carry a lot of these um, marginal identities or identities that carry with them a lot of implicit bias. Awesome. And, and you know, I wrote down that um, you said earlier that you like disrupting expectations. I love that. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> I, I'll also tell you, I'll also tell you that. Um, I did, uh, when we were in law school, I spent a semester at UCLA, and Kim Crenshaw taught there, and I took her class on race. You. And I actually, and I, and I thought, well, I don't know, because I thought, I'm black, I'm going to do well in this class. She was so smart that I didn't understand a word she said. I had no idea what she was talking about. But I do feel lucky that, that I had that experience. Um, and um, and I also feel very lucky that you agreed uh, to join us today. I want to thank you, Sheila, for being here to BS with me today. Um, well, thank and you. Uh, I, I hope I hope you had fun. I had a great time. It's so great to reconnect with you. Um, and this is an amazing podcast. So I'm going to tune in now. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, and thanks to everybody for listening. Hit it! That's what I'm talking about! Wait! Okay now, from the beginning. We hope you enjoyed the stories shared in today's episode of BS, Beyond Stereotypes. Join us next time when another authentic personality unleashes their uniqueness on the world.